So here's number one. I'm going to start out. It's a 63-year-old woman with established restrictive cardiomyopathy, presents with increasing effort intolerance and dyspnea. She relates having to stop and rest after walking from the kitchen to the bedroom. She currently is on furosemide 40 twice a day and metoprolol twice a day. On examination, her heart rate is 60, blood pressure is 105 over 60, her venous pressure is about 10 centimeters. She has a rapid Y descent and we'll go over some of the contours of the venous pressure over the course. Her lungs are clear and she has a third heart sound on auscultation of her heart. Which of the following is the next best step in her management? Number one, decrease the metoprolol dose. Number two, add low dose lisinopril. Number three, increase the furosemide. Number four, decrease the furosemide. So let's see what you would do in this 63 year old woman with quite a severe restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay, so Dr. Amon's got some work to do here. 36 year old man presents with dyspnea on exertion over the past six months. Symptoms are worse in warm environments and particularly following heavy meals. And that's a good clinical clue there. Echocardiography reveals left ventricular hypertrophy with a maximal septal thickness of 24 millimeter. There is no systolic anterior motion or outflow track obstruction by Doppler echocardiography noted. You examine the person, the carotid upstroke is brisk, the lungs are clear, and there's a two over six systolic ejection murmur that increases going from the squat to the stand maneuver. So you squat them down, stand them up, the murmur increases in intensity. Which of the following is the next best step? Cardiac MRI, echo with provocation, coronary angiography, or transesophageal echocardiography. And this young 36-year-old man who has increasing symptoms of dyspnea. Go ahead and let us know what you would do. Okay. And then a 48-year-old man with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy received a defibrillator after experiencing an out-of-hospital arrest. His maximal wall thickness is 25 millimeter. He has a dynamic outflow track obstruction. His gradient is 64 millimeter of mercury at rest. He's active and asymptomatic. What would you advise regarding screening of his relatives? Number one, all adult first degree relatives should have an echocardiogram once after age 25 to exclude hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Number two, echocardiography is recommended every two years in all first degree relatives. Number three, first degree relatives engaged in competitive athletics should be screened annually. And number four, a normal electrocardiogram is sufficient to exclude the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the family members. All right, a stepwise approach here. <laughs> Okay, a 64-year-old woman, hypertension, presents to the evaluation of new onset dyspnea on exertion. She has class two symptoms. Blood pressure is 118 over 70, pulse is 64. She's taking amlodipine 10, metoprolol 25 twice a day, and aspirin 325 per day. An echocardiogram reveals hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the septal thickness is 22 millimeter with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and moderate mitral regurgitation. And the Doppler shows an outflow track gradient of 50 at rest, increasing to 80 during the strain phase of the Valsalva maneuver. Which of the following would you recommend in this person? Number one, discontinue amlodipine. Number two, increase metoprolol. Number three, septal myectomy. Number four, septal ablation.
Steve, I think you still have quite a bit of work to do here. Um, last question, ICD implantation is considered appropriate for which of the following indications? Syncope, when the blood was drawn about 10 days ago. An outflow tract gradient greater than 90 by Doppler echocardiography. A maximal wall thickness of greater than 30 millimeter or late gadolinium enhancement of more than 5% of the LV mass in cardiac MRI. Very important question. Okay, not bad. We'll go on, and uh, Dr. Raman, who you've already met, is actually the chair of our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic. He, he, he's, he's nationally and internationally known in this. He actually, uh, even though his name's not first, he wrote the guidelines that you'll see for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, we've asked him to give you an overview of all of the uh, cardiomyopathies uh, over the next 35 minutes. So, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Nish, and thanks to all of you again. We'll, uh, we'll kick off. Um, I have no disclosures for this talk or any of the others that I give. These are the learning objectives that we're going to cover during the lecture today, and I'll go over each of those again uh, throughout the lecture, but you can refer back to those if you want. This is just a slide of one classification scheme that you can use for cardiomyopathies. I have one slide on dilated cardiomyopathies, which we'll get to next. Um, but um, you won't have to memorize this, but this is just a nice way to keep things uh, in mind if you're, if you're looking forward. The main thing I want to say about dilated cardiomyopathy, because really we're going to address that on Wednesday uh, with the heart failure lectures, is in your practice and on the board examination, what you always want to make sure you're doing is looking for reversible causes for a cardiomyopathy. So testable items are someone who drinks a lot. Um, also, hemochromatosis is something that people get confused. That's not an LVH causing cardiomyopathy, it's a dilated causing cardiomyopathy. So if they have diabetes and testosterone insufficiency and they've got funny colored skin, you might want to think about iron uh, studies for hemochromatosis. But look for reversible causes uh, for cardiomyopathies in your practice for sure and on the board test. But what we want to do is talk about some of the non-dilated cardiomyopathies, um, both for pattern recognition and the basics of treatment for a few of these. So this is a classic electrocardiogram of someone with a restrictive type cardiomyopathy. So you can see, for those of you who aren't echo people on the left, is a peristonal long axis image showing normal left ventricular systolic function, normal wall thickness, and a giant left atrium. In the apical view, again, normal LV size, and then the, both, the atria are actually bigger than the ventricles. This should instantly start making you think about, uh, this looks like a restrictive type patient to me. This is what you might see for Doppler patterns. On a board test, they're going to focus on this top left, and that is the mitral inflow for someone with restrictive physiology or restrictive cardiomyopathy with rapid inflow when the mitral valve first opens and almost nothing happening the rest of diastole. When the heart is filling, it's almost done filling in the first 100, 150 milliseconds of diastole, and that's important for one of the questions you saw earlier. But if you see someone who's got normal LV function, is middle-aged or older, and has a mitral inflow that looks like this, they have restrictive physiology. High E, low A, the atrium almost can't push anything into the ventricle. This is the cath lab tracing that you're used to seeing. It is the deep descent here, early uh, diastolic filling, the square root sign, dip and plateau. And we'll talk about these more in my second lecture today when we're trying to distinguish restriction from constriction. Um, the, the basic tenet is people with restrictive cardiomyopathy tend to have bigger problems on the left side of their heart than on the right side of their heart. So they're going to have higher pressures on the left side and pulmonary hypertension, which aren't as true about constriction. But we'll get to that in uh, my second lecture of the morning. Now, these are the different causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Again, you're not going to be tested on different subtypes. What you want to do is just remember that some of these things might trigger a thought of saying, gosh, this person might have a restrictive type pattern if they give you uh, clues in the stem of a multiple choice question. 
Radiation therapy can cause constriction and restriction, so you have to be careful about that one. Um, and I'll show you a case of amyloid in the next slide or two. The main treatments for idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathy are not awesome. There's not a lot we can do for these patients. You have to carefully diurese them if they have signs of volume overload, if they have crackles in their lungs, if their JVP is super high, because you can't aggressively diurese them because they need some preload to fill their ventricle. The ventricle's too stiff. It needs some driving pressure to get blood into the ventricle. So if you give them too much diuretic, they're going to feel weak and, and not have any energy and, and hypotensive and have, have syncope. Beta blockers can be useful, but, but for the reasons I talked about for that diastolic filling period, you can't, if you overly beta block them, they're going to feel worse. Because when you slow down the heart rate, all you do is prolong diastole. And if you're filling your ventricle all in the first 130 milliseconds of diastole, and the rest of the time the heart's just sitting there doing nothing, that means the person's having no cardiac output gains. So when you slow their heart rate down, you're just decreasing their cardiac output. So you might want a restrictive patient to run with a slightly faster heart rate than the typical dilated cardiomyopathy patient we talk about. But really, transplant is the main therapy that if you have a person with advanced restrictive cardiomyopathy and they're a candidate, that's probably going to be their best bet to getting back to a reasonable quality of life. Now, some of the specific subtypes of restrictive cardiomyopathies. This is the amyloid case I promised you. So a little bit of a novel because the wall thickness is super, can be super thick in amyloid. This is a kind of a classic echo. The, the ECG in this case, by the way, it might show normal voltage or small voltage when it's amyloid, but thick walls, and the atria aren't as big in amyloid sometimes. You might have thickened valves, you might have a small pericardial effusion, but that's one that uh, test takers like to trip you up on. If you see, they show you a still frame of an echo with super thick walls and an ECG that has normal or low voltage, your radar should be going off screaming at you this could be amyloid in this test question. This is a case of hyper eosinophilia. So this can happen with an, a, a condition called idiopathic hyper-eosinophilic syndrome. It can happen with eosinophilic leukemias. It can happen with things like Churg-Strauss vasculitis, where there's lots of eosinophils. They end up depositing on the LV walls and the major basic protein degranulates and starts to collect uh, fibrin and clotting elements that then line the inside of the ventricle, and that can lead to an endomyocardial fibrosis and restrictive filling pattern. It can be in either apex of, of the ventricles, and it can start to extend along this lateral wall and start to impair the function of the mitral valve. If you see mobile elements, then anticoagulation can help resolve this. If there's no longer any mobile elements, then you start talking to your hematology friends about uh, chemotherapeutic agents that might be helpful for treating these patients. Other things that you might see, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. You'll hear a little bit about this on the electrophysiology day. This is fatty replacement of the RV free wall. Here is the uh, gross pathologic specimen. Here's the fatty cells within the RV on the H&E stain. This is an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. You will not be required to memorize the extremely complicated inclusion, exclusion criteria for making this diagnosis. They know that in the modern era you're going to look these things up if you start to see someone who has funky uh, repolarization abnormalities in the right-sided chest leads and they have a big boggy looking RV on an echo, you're going to start looking at those things. They're not going to test you on the minutiae. What they want you to know is that these abnormalities occur, that, that it can be familial so you're going to want to screen family members. Defibrillators are probably indicated and you probably want to tell them not to be competitive athletes because they're likely to have more problems with arrhythmias. This is non-compaction cardiomyopathy. So more and more we're seeing this on imaging studies and I think more and more we're realizing it might not be as awful a situation as we originally thought. Like most diseases, I think we saw the tip of the iceberg at the beginning and now we're seeing that there's a whole spectrum of people with that, but it's failure of the trabeculations to compact into normal myocardium. Here's another case with a little bit more hypertrophy of those trabeculations, often confused with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is what the imaging looks like. Um, but what you're going to see is these crypts and recesses like you see here along the apical septum 
And with echo contrast, that really lights up and shows you it's not there. Obviously, cardiac MRI is particularly suited to showing you this abnormality as well. Some basics about these patients. The report is that people who have symptoms tend to report with dyspnea. But again, most people now are being found incidentally because they're getting echoes or cardiac imaging for other reasons. So now most of the patients are asymptomatic when they come to you. And it, it causes lots of alarm because they go to the internet and they see that heart failure and sudden death are in their future. And, and we just aren't really seeing that accumulate uh, that often. Uh, the current recommendations are they are also would be excluded from competitive athletics. This is kind of my algorithm for how I approach patients with non-compaction cardiomyopathy. The first thing I look at is their overall ventricular function. If they have normal ventricular systolic function, then you consider treating them as a stage B heart failure patient, i.e. they have a structural abnormality that might lead to heart failure, so you could consider adding a beta blocker or ACE inhibitor if, they, if there's someone who might want to avoid cardiomyopathy or dilation in the future, although there's no randomized data for that. This is purely empiric thought. And then you're probably going to want to use sudden cardiac death risk criteria similar to HCM because there are overlaps, and we'll talk about that more. If they have a low ejection fraction with non-compaction cardiomyopathy, then you need to treat them as a patient with a low ejection fraction. And then all those criteria for dilated cardiomyopathy apply. Officially, in the device-based therapy guidelines, non-compaction cardiomyopathy is a class 2B indication for a defibrillator, meaning they're not sure that a defibrillator adds much, but they didn't make it an exclusion and they didn't elevate it to a higher class. And I just think you can make that a little bit more subtle by adding a few historic features. If they have non-compaction cardiomyopathy and a family history of sudden death, or they have VT, or they have syncope, or they have a really low EF, I think that elevates them from a class 2B indication to at least a class 2A indication for considering a device for those individuals. All right. That concludes the non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy portion of this lecture um, because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a test or is a disease that test writers love to ask questions about. It's got genetics, it's got electrical issues, it's got hemodynamic issues, uh, so it's really ripe for writing questions. The first thing you have to think about when you see someone in the echo lab with thick walls is why do they have thick walls? It's a reasonable question. It could be hypertension, but really most patients who have hypertension don't have wall thicknesses above about 16 or 17. So if you have someone with wall thicknesses of 20 or more, unless their blood pressure is 200 or more for the last 10 years, they're unlikely to have wall thickness that severe. They're more likely to have concentric hypertrophy if they have hypertension. The other things that can cause thick walls are also on this slide, but remember most of those things come with other clinical signs or symptoms. If they have thick walls because of their renal disease, you better be able to see that a creatinine is four and a half or five or six. If they have Friedrich's ataxia, they, you know, they're going to have ataxia. It's kind of by definition uh, that that's going to be there. So if they have LVH with no other explanation and no other syndromic signs or features, then you're talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The one that seems to cause a lot of confusion or concern for people is, well, I've got this guy who's athletic. Maybe he's got athlete's heart. So these are the criteria that we typically talk about for distinguishing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from athlete's heart. I will tell you it's almost better to step back and look at the images qualitatively rather than quantitatively. An athlete's heart is going to dilate a little bit too. They need a bigger stroke volume for an endurance athlete. So their heart is going to look proportional to itself. Whereas a pathologic HCM patient is going to have more hypertrophy than chamber. And sometimes that qualitative assessment is important to realize. It's also important to realize that uh, even elite athletes rarely hypertrophy their heart more than a millimeter or two. So again, we're talking about wall thicknesses of 16 or 17, not 20 to 25 to 30. If you have wall thicknesses that thick, it's pathologic. And what these criteria show here on the slide is you are looking for signs of other evidence of pathology. That's going to move you more towards a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If they have signs of better than normal physiology, that's more like an athlete. And that's really what those criteria break down to. <laughs>
So this is our specimen of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the point here is that the hypertrophy can occur anywhere. The cellular architecture is abnormal. It's not the typical uh, cardiac uh, structure. Um, you can get big atria, but look how thick this ventricle is. Uh, there's a contact lesion against that septum there. So this is what every patient who comes into your office or comes into my office with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is expected to know when they leave. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic disease that affects one in 500 people around the world. It does not have a high prevalence in terms of geography, culture, ethnicity, sex. The overall prognosis is good. Most people with HCM live a near normal lifespan with a near normal quality of life, and we can usually get them there. But there is a sudden cardiac death rate of about 1% per year, so we'll talk about risk stratification. They need to think about their family, and we have a couple of screening algorithms for their family members. They can exercise. We can talk about competitive athletics, but we want our patients to be healthy like we want all of the rest of us in this room to be healthy. So we want them to be able to participate in low to moderate intensity exercise. And all of our medical therapies are symptom relieving therapies. What that means is an asymptomatic person doesn't need to get put on beta blockers just because they have thick walls. If they don't have symptoms, they can continue to just be monitored off of medication. Some of the things that you see on board tests, although they don't focus on the physical exam quite as much as they used to, but a few features here about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. First of all, they're gonna have a loud murmur, but the carotids are gonna be normal or brisk. An AS patient with a loud systolic injection murmur is gonna have parvus and tardis in their carotids. That's a clue you might wanna think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A bifid apical impulse is actually a, a palpable S4. And when you start talking about maneuvers, Valsalva, squat to stand, exercise, we've all read the textbooks and seen the charts of all the different murmurs, those kind of things. The reality is the only murmur that changes appreciably that almost all of us can appreciate without much effort is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Everything else is subtle. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the person who has, minimum, has a grade one murmur at rest and it's three when you have them do a squat to stand. Nothing else changes like that. So in your practice, if you're hearing a really, really dynamic murmur, it means they have a really dynamic outflow tract obstruction and it's more likely HCM than a primary valve problem. This is a classic ECG, again, for pattern recognitions. This is the textbook ECG for someone with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These narrow, deep, symmetric T-wave inversions, particularly in the lateral leads. While it is the classic taunt ECG, it's not that common in, in reality, but that's the kind of thing that you would expect to see on a board test that then put you into the frame of mind to think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as, the, as what they're testing. Again, just a cartoon and reminding you that the hypertrophy can occur anywhere. Basal septum, whole septum, lateral wall, whole ventricle, or just the apex. It's unexplained hypertrophy that can occur anywhere. Now, what about the genetic makeup? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an autosomal dominant disease when it is uh, identified as having a genetic basis. It is basically the uh, proteins that make up the cardiac sarcomere. There's been more than 14 genes that have been identified with abnormalities, can be associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we don't know why they cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or why the hypertrophy is asymmetric. These are the list of the genes. Most of the patients that are identified have a myosin heavy chain or myosin binding protein C mutation. When they're identified, there's a few troponin I's and the rest of those have been reported in a few different uh, series. But the most, most of our patients who have genetically identified HCM are in this top group of, of diagnoses, uh, are, are uh, proteins. So, these are what we have to talk about with our patients. Once you've done the diagnosis is we're gonna to talk to them about their family, we're gonna to talk to them about treatment, and we're gonna to talk to them about death prevention. So for family screening, we either can do genetic testing or we can do echocardiographic or other imaging-based surveillance. And we generally start screening patients when they get to adolescence. It is pretty rare for a single-digit age kid who is otherwise normally to have 
detectable phenotypic expression of HCM at that age. They start to transform during their adolescent years. So we usually start screening when kids hit puberty. We do it every year through puberty or while they're participating in competitive athletics. And after that, once they're an adult no longer competing in athletics, we screen them every five years if we're using imaging as our screening modality. For the genetic testing, the issue why we don't use it more often is, one, it's expensive because many insurance plans don't cover it, so it's out-of-pocket expense for patients. And we only find a mutation about 50 to 60% of the time now when we do a genetic test, just because there's probably more mutations that cause it that we haven't discovered yet. And so there's a 40 to 50% chance you're going to do a test that's not helpful that then the patient's going to have to pay for. If you do find the mutation in that proband, the patient you're seeing, then it becomes the preferred screening method for their kids and their siblings because you can eliminate whole branches of the family tree that need screening if they don't have the mutation in that, in that arm of the family tree. But if you do the testing and don't have a mutation, then you go back to the echo imaging that I had on the previous slide. Now, the management plan for a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, remember, medications are for treatment of symptoms, which means treatment of hemodynamics. But there's some general things you need to consider first, and that is, as I mentioned before, there was an era when all patients with HCM were told to just sit around, don't do anything because it's dangerous to you. We're learning more and more that people with HCM can lead normal, healthy lifestyles, and we want them to do that because the combination of metabolic syndrome plus HCM is not just additive, it's, it's actually synergistic in terms of the complications that occur for those patients. So we want them to be healthy, participating people uh, in life. Yes, we want them to avoid extreme efforts where they're going to potentially get themselves into ischemia and arrhythmia issues, but they can exercise with low to moderate intensity, just make sure, particularly those who are obstructives, hydrate themselves before, during, and after their exercise because they are more prone to um, hypotension uh, and syncope if they have not hydrated adequately. In order to understand the treatment of the symptoms, you have to understand the pathophysiology. The thick heart muscle is a stiff heart muscle, which means almost all patients with HCM have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. But almost three quarters of patients have obstruction, either at rest or with simple exercise. And that obstruction increases the pressure within the ventricle, which decreases the coronary perfusion pressure and causes subendocardial ischemia. That subendocardial ischemia makes the ventricle stiffer when they're ischemic, and it also can cause angina. The outflow tract obstruction deforms the mitral valve. The mitral valve is an innocent bystander, but it gets deformed and opened up, so you get mitral regurgitation, which can cause shortness of breath. And then obviously with the obstruction, you can decrease forward stroke volume, and a patient can feel lightheaded or, or have syncope. So you can see why obstruction becomes such an attractive target for therapies and why there's been so much study over the years on this. So this is, again, just a cartoon of what happens with the obstruction. The blood has to flow around this thick part of the septum here, and it actually ends up pushing on the mitral valve and pushing the mitral valve into the outflow tract obstruction, opening it up, and resulting in mitral regurgitation as well. That obstruction gets worse when contractility goes up or when afterload or preload go down which happens when you stand up out of your chair and walk to the back of the room. And that's why HCM patients are rarely ever symptomatic at rest, because usually the hemodynamics are acceptable at rest. But as soon as they stand up, their preload and afterload drop, their heart tries to pick up, and they obstruct a little bit more. And that's why they get short of breath walking to the back of the room. It also gives us, if we can do the opposite of those things, we can treat their symptoms better. So we're going to want to not augment their contractility. We're going to want to not vasodilate them. Avoid pure vasodilators. If they have hypertension, let's use beta blockers or verapamil or diltiazem for their hypertension, not ACE inhibitors or the dihydropyridine class calcium channel blockers because those will just make their obstruction worse. And we don't want to use high-dose diuretics because you're dropping the preload. So the mainstays of therapy for a symptomatic patient with HCM are beta blockers, and these two calcium channel blockers. If that's not effective, you can consider adding disapyramide uh, to one of the other uh, agents uh, to try to re 
decrease their obstruction. Eliminate unnecessary vasodilators and replace it with one of the agents above, um, and then make sure they're hydrated. Success of medical therapy is not determined in the echo lab, it's determined in the patient's life. If, a pa if you've started a beta blocker or increased a beta blocker and they come to you and say, I feel better, then, they, then the medication is successful, even though the echo gradient may be unchanged, because the gradient changes throughout the day every day, and it's not really the resting gradient you're trying to decrease, it's their exercise-induced gradient when they get symptoms, and so the beta blocker, if they feel better, it's being effective for them. And, this, and the graph on the right is just saying, even in a practice like ours, where so many of our patients are sent to us for invasive therapy for their outflow tract obstruction, almost two-thirds of them go away with adjustments in their medications as their first effort to help them feel better, because usually careful attention to that medication list, including eliminating medications, are very successful in treating these patients. But there are those patients in whom the medications are not successful and they have lifestyle limiting symptoms. And that's when we start talking about surgical myectomy and septal ablation as therapies to mechanically change the heart in a way that can more durably relieve that outflow tract obstruction. So those are the criteria. They have to have obstruction. They have to be refractory to medications. Um, and then you can consider these therapies. So. What we know about myectomy is that the operative mortality is now about a half a percent. That number is actually too high that's listed there. The gradient is virtually abolished in a durable way. The muscle doesn't regrow. And postoperatively, we quote about a 90 to 95% success rate. Patients are glad they had the operation because they can do more than they could before the operation. And many patients can get off of their other medications after a successful myectomy. We published this more than 10 years now showing after myectomy, survival is equivalent to age-matched general population. So there was some thoughts historically that myectomy might relieve symptoms but hasten death. That's not true. We've, we see excellent outcomes both in terms of overall survival, cardiac survival, and in decreasing the arrhythmia burden for our patients after myectomy. This is looking at appropriate ICD discharge amongst those patients who had risk factors. People who have a myectomy, their rate of appropriate discharge following the myectomy is very, very low. So we feel really good that looking at historic, observational, non-randomized data, that myectomy not only has a very high hemodynamic and symptom relieving benefit, but seems to have at least a, a positive benefit on overall survival. What about ablation? Don't call it the new kid on the block anymore because it's been around for 15 or 20 years as well. Same basic criteria to start the procedure. The idea here is rather than doing a surgical uh, thinning of the septum, you infarct the basal septum by injecting alcohol and that retracts the septum as it scars and gets it out of the way. Lots of studies have been done on this, most of them relatively small. The gradient reduction for those patients in whom it's successful is good. The New York Heart Association class improvement following a successful ablation is good. The complication rates are slightly different because there's a fair bit of complete heart block induced by injecting alcohol into the septum, and so there's a high pacemaker rate, but infarcts have occurred, and there's a mortality rate following uh, a septal ablation that is equivalent to the same mortality rate for spontaneous infarcts of a similar size about 2% per year death rate if you have an infarct spontaneously due to uh, an occluded coronary artery. Same thing for septal ablation. The issue is about 20% of patients won't respond to ablation because their anatomy just doesn't match up right. Um, and so we counsel patients about both of the procedures. Looking at studies here that our colleague Paul Saraja published a handful of years ago, survival free from advanced symptoms is good when you look at all comers, but when you look at young patients, there's a slight benefit for uh, myectomy over ablation, and so that tends to be our treatment pathway. I don't think that you will be tested on this fact. I don't think you'll be tested, other than maybe on one of my post-test questions, about choosing between ablation and myectomy. I think that is too controversial and too nuanced to test uh, on a board examination. This is what our guidelines say. 
If a patient has drug refractory symptoms, the first consideration is, are they a surgical candidate? If they are a surgical candidate, then myectomy is the preferred strategy because it's so predictable and the results are so durable. If they are not a surgical candidate, then, be then ablation becomes a much more attractive therapy and that becomes the class 2A indication. Now, switching gears and talking about sudden cardiac death prevention. So I mentioned to you that sudden cardiac death occurs in approximately 1% of HCM patients each year. Patients always say, well, I'll think about that when my symptoms get worse. And you have to point out the reason why they, the word sudden is in it is because it's unpredictable and it has nothing to do with their symptom status. About 1% of patients each year experience sudden cardiac death. This is kind of the current state of risk stratification, and most of you did pretty well on that pretest question. The items in blue are still considered to be the primary risk factors for sudden cardiac death in HCM patients. Non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, really severe left ventricular hypertrophy, a drop in blood pressure with exercise, unexplained syncope, particularly if it's occurred in the last six months, or a family history of sudden cardiac death in a first degree relative. There was a lots of thoughts that the genes might predict sudden cardiac death. That has not proven to be true in subsequent analyses. So their specific genotype doesn't seem to play a role. The MRI is an emerging risk factor, but the amount of MRI scar you need to see has to be above 15 to 20 percent of the LV replaced by scar before it reaches statistical uh, impact. So that's a lot of scar in a ventricle. Your MRI port should say extensive gadolinium delayed enhancement or you know, more than 20% of the LV is replaced by scar. That's when the MRI becomes really worrisome. Less than that, it doesn't seem to have as much weight. It probably has an impact on the non-sustained VT or the severity or, or is caused by severity of LVH, but it is not an independent risk factor at this point. And while severity of outflow tract obstruction has been associated with increasing risk for sudden cardiac death, I mentioned to you the gradient changes every few minutes. It, I mean, during one echo study or one cath study, you can be non-obstructive at one moment and have a gradient of 50 at another moment. That, you can't implant a, a defibrillator based on a moving target very well. So it's a tough one to incorporate uh, into, into practice. But so we typically look at those risk factors this is the uh, ACCAHA guidelines criteria. If they've had an event or sustained ventricular arrhythmias, that, those are the only class one indications for a defibrillator. Everything else is class two or lower. If they have family history, super thick walls, or recent unexplained sy syncope, that's a two way. If they only have non-sustained VT or a drop in blood pressure, and that's the only thing they've got, that's kind of the class 2B, the role of an ICD is uncertain. But there's this modifying category here. If they have non-sustained VT and their wall thicknesses are 28, that's pretty close to 30. And just intellectually, that person probably becomes a class 2A, particularly if they're a young patient. So if you look at the document, the ACC guidelines, other SCD risk modifiers, that's almost risk factors. Or if there is a fair bit of, non, of, of gadolinium enhancement, but it doesn't meet that 20% criteria and they have non-sustained VT, you're going to be more concerned about those patients and counsel them. Now, there is a, a good tool that I use for most of my patients. It's an online risk calculator. If you just type in HCM SCD risk, you can find this calculator online. It is part of the ESC guidelines. You will not be tested on this. It's just nice to know it's there for, for help in counseling patients. This will give a patient, based on their clinical parameters, a five-year estimate of their chance of sudden death. Some people like to think about those proportions. Some patients like that better than a dogmatic uh, assessment of their risk factors and, and, and that discourse. But it, you know, it's interesting. Things come around. If they have no risk factors, you're basically going to reassure those patients that their risk is low but not zero. If they have one or more risk factors, all the therapy is individualized. It's shared decision-making with the patient unless they've had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest or they have VT or VF that's sustained, then they all become class one. So these are the board pearls that I have, and then we'll uh, answer some of those questions again. Remember that if they talk about a murmur that changes dramatically on examination, that's most likely HCM and not something else. <laughs> 
Beta blockers, verapamil, and, my, and maybe diltiazem are your first line drugs for symptomatic obstructive HCM. And ICDs are only put in for patients who have one or more of those main risk factors right there. And remember, it comes up every year, patients with apical HCM go through the same risk stratification as people with non-apical HCM, with obstructive HCM. It's the same risk factors. Just because their hypertrophy is in a different spot doesn't change their risk. So I think with that, I thank you for attention, and I think we will go ahead and answer some questions. Have a seat. Very uh, nicely done. And, um, you know, Steve referred to the uh, guidelines in 2011. And, and just for fellows taking the boards, um, if you know the guidelines, um, that is what you're going to use to answer the question. Anything controversial will probably not be there. And anything that was published in the last couple years um, will not have time to have made it to the boards. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, looking at the most recent MRI with gadolinium uh, paper to, to try to decide whether that should be incorporated. I would just make sure that you know the guidelines because even though people complain about the guidelines, remember that it's a group of experts who have gotten together, reviewed the literature, and come to a consensus. So, so we really use that as, as kind of the gold standard in the areas of controversy. Now let's go back to the questions and um, see, see what you've done now that you've heard the famous Dr. Raman give this overall view, but you've got your 63-year-old woman uh, with established restrictive cardiomyopathy. Her heart rate is 60. She's on both furosemide and metoprolol. Which of the following is the next best step in her management? Okay. Steve, you want to... Uh... Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So, th so this was a, a question written specifically to test that point about the diastolic filling period. And if their heart rate is super slow from beta blockers, um, you might make them feel better by letting their heart rate run a little faster. So backing off on the beta blocker dose here might be more successful. This person did not have crackles on their examination, and they did not have eleva you know, markedly elevated JVP, so increasing the furosemide probably isn't going to add a lot to this, but if you increase their heart rate by 10 beats per minute, they might feel really better just because you've shortened that diastasis period or, or period of complete inactivity during the cardiac cycle. Yeah. Which is kind of supported by the mitral flow velocities that right. you showed, which would be in this person, what, what would the mitral flow the velocity The mitral inflow be? would have this giant E wave and a little tiny A wave. And so the more you take advantage of con contraction shortly after uh, the heart is filled, the better they're going to be. Um, there was a point I was going to make that I just lost. That's okay. It'll come back to me. Early um, rapid yeah. filling, though, and restrictive cardiomyopathy, um, you probably don't want to prolong the heart rate because all of that's going to do is reduce your cardiac output. And that's, that's what Steve's point is here. The, the point I was going to make is the other thing is, is patients who have restrictive filling, when they go into AFib, aren't the ones that suddenly go from class 1 or 2 to class 4 because they don't get much contribution from atrial filling. It's your patient who have mild diastolic dysfunction with like grade one filling pattern where the E is low and the A is super big. When they lose atrial contractility, they lose about a third of the filling of their, of their ventricle. They become more symptomatic than the patient who has a restrictive filling pattern uh, at baseline. And, and there were some questions about differentiating restrictive cardiomyopathy from constrictive pericarditis, which is something that is a difficult thing to do. But that's why we gave Steve the entire fourth lecture to talk about the differentiation between these two groups of patients, both of whom will have normal systolic function, severe right heart failure, one needs a pericardiectomy, the other needs medical therapy or transplantation. So stay, stay tuned for Steve's lecture, the fourth lecture right before lunch today. Let's go to the next question. 
36-year-old man has dyspnea on exertion over the past six months. Symptoms are worse in warm environments and following meals, following meals, following meals. Okay. Echocardiography reveals left ventricular hypertrophy. The septal thickness is 2.4 centimeters. No systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. However, on examination, you do hear that murmur. Squat to stand makes it increase in intensity. Which of the following is the next best step? MRI scan, echo with provocation, coronary angiography, or transesophageal echo? It's almost a mic drop, but not quite. A what drop? I can walk off the stage. Oh. <laughs> um, so, so that's right. So, so the point here is that the resting gradient may not be very high in the echo lab. In fact, it's probably when it's going to be lowest during the day because you put a patient in a, in a, you know, a horizontal position, you're maximizing their preload, so their gradient might not be very high. It's going to be higher leaving the echo lab than it was during their echo study. So if you have someone who has exertional symptoms, and you heard a dynamic murmur and the resting echo doesn't show a resting gradient, you need to do something to provoke that patient, be it exercise echo or a valsalva maneuver or amyl nitrite or something like that to prove that they have obstruction. Yeah. And, and the reason is it's a critical difference in how you treat the patient, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, if they have obstruction versus non-obstructive. Yeah. So how do you treat the non-obstructives? So the non-obstructives uh, end up being a lot like the... Um, restrictive patients in some degree. You can use low-dose diuretics. Um, some of those patients have angina as more of a symptom, and I tend to use the calcium channel blockers as their first-line therapy just because I've anecdotally had more, more success with using that for the non-obstructive patient. Yeah. The other thing about this question, and you emphasized it when you read it, was the postprandial exacerbation of symptoms. And that's probably because when people eat, they then dilate their whole splanchnic vascular bed and they're dropping their preload and afterload. So often you'll have patients who have difficulty leaving a restaurant and had no problem walking into it. Not just because they were hungry, but because they actually are now having hemodynamic <laughs> uh, uh, response to their food. It, and it really is a good marker to determine which patients will benefit from septal reduction therapy. Yeah. If they say, God, doc, I, I, I can't do anything after I eat, and they have a gradient, um, if they get that gradient taken care of, they're really going to improve their yeah. symptoms. Okay, so let's go to the next one. A 48-year-old man, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, received a defibrillator after experiencing an out-of-hospital arrest. Maximal wall thickness is 25 millimeter, and he's a dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction with a gradient of 64. Which would you advise in screening his relatives? All adult first degree relatives should have an echocardiogram once after age 25. Echo is recommended every two years in all first degree relatives. First degree relatives engaged in competitive athletics should be screened annually. A normal electrocardiogram is sufficient to exclude hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Good. Very good. Yeah, so as from the lecture, if they're engaging in competitive athletics or their adolescent age, then the screening is annual. Once they're adults, it's every five years. 5% of patients with HCM have a completely normal ECG. Um, so that's kind of the main features. The other thing that this question is written for is just a reminder that if you're someone on, who is pressed for time during standardized testing, sometimes you want to just read what they're asking for before you read the, the stem of the question because nothing in the yellow on this screen was helpful to answer the question. <laughs> it was, you just, it, this is just a factual question about family screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and all that did was waste your time if you read through all the yellow first. So um, for those of you who've put questions into the portal, you'll, you'll kind of hear some of your questions reflected in the conversation here. But um, do you keep on screening these first degree mm. relatives like until they become old, like as old as I am and older and stuff? Wow, that is a deep question. Um, 
So the, so the kind of rule of thumb is if they get to their mid-60s or so and, ha and have had a series of normal echoes, you probably don't need to keep screening after that. But you need to screen at least until that point because there have been a number of case reports of late onset HCM. It's not common, but it occurs. Yeah. And the, the fact this is sudden, you're, you're screening basically to try to prevent sudden death yep. and, and sudden death in a 60, 65 year old is yep. very uncommon. Yep. Okay. And then there was a question about why do you screen teenagers every year? What's the rationale behind that? Well, the, the rationale is, is a couple fold. One is we think that's when the, the most rapid accumulation of hypertrophy can occur, so you're going to be able to detect it sooner then. The other thing is, is that um, you know, there are seven to 10 million high school athletes, uh, and so adolescence is when kids are super engaged in exercise and competition and those kind of things, and you just want to be able to screen them and have a thorough conversation with them about risks and benefits of doing that. And so that's, it just seems to be a critical inflection uh, for the disease, and that's why we're more aggressive during that time period. And, and you had spoken about genetic screening, but there were a couple questions that came through the portal. So, you, you know, if you're in that 50 to 60 percent category where you get a positive gene mm -hmm. that's responsible for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, can, can you tell us again sure. what you do with their first degree relatives? Yeah, so, so if you find a class one is the official term mutation, meaning it's felt to be disease causing, then you can simply test their siblings and children in the same lab for that mutation only. So that follow-up test is much less expensive because they're only looking for the family mutation in that case. And so if a sibling does not have the mutation that your patient has, then that sibling can't get HCM and they can't pass it on. So then that branch of the family tree doesn't have to go through further screening. If that sibling does have the mutation, then you would say, well, let's talk about testing your children just so you can start to fill up the family tree. So you basically chase positives around the family tree. So, so just to summarize, because there were, were some questions, yep. um, all teenagers every year, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody in competitive athletics, no matter how old they are, every year? Yeah, you probably, similar, you probably start to spread that out if they get to be a middle-aged athlete like yourself. They, they should yeah. be competitive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then, and then other, otherwise it's every five years then uh, once they reach adulthood, right? Right. And, yep. Until they get old. Until they get old. Okay. Yep. Got it. All right. Uh, let's go to the next question. A 64-year-old woman with hypertension presents for the evaluation of new onset dyspnea. She's got class two symptoms, blood pressure's 118, pulse 64, she's on them. Lodipine, metoprolol, and aspirin. She's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and she's got a severe gradient. What is the next step in management? Discontinue her amlodipine, increase metoprolol, septal myectomy, septal ablation. Good. Yeah, so this is, this is eliminating the um, vasodilator therapy as your first step. Um, have had some tremendous successes getting rid of nifedipine, amlodipine, lisinopril from patients' medication lists, and sometimes their symptoms just went away with that. The issue is, in someone with hypertension, you might have to then counterbalance that with an increase in the metoprolol, but you, only, you, you want to see if that happens before you just automatically do it. It does come up every year, people ask me how you do manage hypertension in someone with HCM if you can't use the vasodilators. You work with the beta blockers or the verapamil or diltiazem, and you can use low-dose thiazide and or low-dose furosemide as for their antihypertensive effects. You just don't want to start increasing the dose to super high levels, but if you, if you want a second antihypertensive agent, that low-dose diuretic is still beneficial in many patients with HCM without augmenting their outflow tract obstruction. So there were actually a few questions about um, medical management. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, every, everybody needs medical management with outflow tract obstruction before proceeding with 
septal reduction therapy, and you mentioned the beta blockers, the calcium blockers, and disapyramide. Can, can you let us know which ones you prefer and what route you would take? Typically, um, typically we start with beta blockers. It tends to be the first line therapy. Now, sometimes people have tried beta blockers before or they have other conditions that make you un unsure about whether you want to use a beta blocker, if they've got depression, if, they, if they're a, a male with erectile dysfunction, if they have other things that make you want to shy away from the beta blockers. Then you would, then you would start with verapamil or diltiazem. Again, you're, you're mostly looking at side effect profiles of those drugs to choose them. So if, if you're seeing someone who's had an issue with peripheral edema, using diltiazem probably doesn't make sense because that's one of the main side effects of diltiazem is that uh, pedal edema that can occur. Um, the one thing you want to definitely stay away from, though, is if someone does have a very high resting gradient, getting close to or above 100 millimeters of mercury. You want to stay away from verapamil and diltiazem because they have provoked uh, pulmonary edema in patients with very high resting gradients. So typically we start beta blocker and switch to calcium channel blocker if it doesn't work unless there was something in that patient's antecedent history that lets you know that maybe you should choose verapamil first. And, and um, somebody was asking about disopyramide and the yeah. need for monitoring. Um, yeah, so disapyramide obviously is an antiarrhythmic drug, which means it, which means it can also be a proarrhythmic drug, um, and it tends to impact uh, QT interval, and, and patients with HCM are prone to having longer QT intervals. So if we're using disapyramide, we generally put them in the hospital to monitor the initiation of it for five uh, dose intervals, just to make sure we aren't putting them at higher risk for uh, proarrhythmia with the disapyramide. Okay, let's go to this last part. Um, the ICD implantation is considered appropriate for which of the following? Most of you got it right before, so quickly punch in your answer. Because what we'll do is, uh, Steve's talked to you about the conventional guidelines, but there's a lot of questions on some of these controversial areas. For those of you taking the boards, you might not want to have to listen to the controversial <laughs> areas, but if you're going to be seeing these patients, um, it's nice to get an expert like Steve to tell you what he would do. So let's first um, punch in what answer you think is the indication for an ICD implantation. Very good. Enough said about Enough that. Enough said, yep. Okay, now here's the other things. Um, what about a person who is at risk for ventricular arrhythmias who is an ICD put in place and wants to continue to play full court basketball? Yeah. So very, very good question. Um, not for the boards. They, 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 on the boards you would say counsel that person not to participate in, in basketball. But there's been this study that was published earlier this year that suggested that there is not a high rate of ICD discharge amongst athletes with defibrillators who have chosen to continue playing. So that's going to be a moving landmark, not for the boards. If they ask you that on the boards, they probably will expunge that question from the boards if it exists just because of that new data. But generally speaking, we do not consider a defibrillator a reason to allow participation. My approach with patients is there is a... Uh, long-held belief that athletes have a higher risk for sudden cardiac death with HCM. It is the patient's choice of how they want to live their life, just like it's all our choices how many alcoholic beverages we have, or people who choose to smoke do so against, you know, you know a lot of evidence. It's their quality of life decision they make. Whether a patient wants to continue exercising at a higher than average level becomes their choice. A defibrillator, though, you don't, they don't say, well, put it in so that I can do this. That's kind of putting the cart before the horse. But there is emerging data, and there's still an ongoing registry looking at activity levels among HCM patients with defibrillators to see if there is a, a signal for increased event rates or not. And I suspect it's going to be less than previously thought, actually. And then one last question, um, does a myectomy preclude the need for an ICD in patients with risk factors? Yeah, that is a really great, great question, and we have typically approached that by we separate the two decisions. Um, because, you know, you, you might decrease the wall thickness by, a my, by using a myectomy, but that's, 
an artificial de decrease in the wall thickness. They still have a lot of myocardium that is prone to risk. So we generally separate those two decisions. Obviously, we're aware that some patients end up saying, well, if I'm having the myectomy because I'm so short of breath, I really don't want a defibrillator, and I think you told me that my risk might be lower if I have the myectomy. So patients put that into their equation, but we have the discussion separately. If someone has massive hypertrophy and VT on their halter, I'm still likely to encourage them to strongly consider a defibrillator. So there's the plumbing, there's the electricity, yep. you probably don't want to... You probably don't want to mix them. Yep. Yeah. 